Hello students and welcome back to chapter 16, the respiratory system. This is part 2. The breathing mechanism is controlled mainly by Boyle's law. This is a law in physics that says that as pressure of a gas in a closed container is inversely proportional to the volume of the container. So as the pressure decreases, volume increases. Or you could say it uh, the other way, as space increases or volume, then pressure decreases or falls. Gas flows from an area of higher to lower pressures. So as that space increases, the pressure decreases and the gases will flow from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. Gas pressure is measured relative to atmospheric pressure, so 70 760 millimeters of mercury is our atmospheric pressure. Now we, we have two syringes here. As we pull the plunger out, we're increasing that space, right? Well, that's also increasing the volume. And remember, as volume increases, pressure is going to decrease. Which way is the air going to flow? it's going to flow in the direction where the pressure is decreasing, okay, is lesser. So as this volume increases in this cylinder, as we pull the plunger out, the volume will increase the amount of space. As that increases, it's going to drop the atmospheric pressure. As the atmospheric pressure drops, air rushes in. So moving the plunger of the syringe causes the air to move in, in this case. In B, we see we're pushing the plunger in. So we're decreasing that space, decreasing the volume. So the pressure or the air moving is going to be inverse or the pressure is going to be inverse which means just the opposite as the space becomes smaller the volume becomes smaller the pressure will increase and the air will rush out or be pushed out so air moves in or out of the lungs according to which or much of the same way. It depends on atmospheric pressure. With the breathing mechanism, uh, inhaling or and exhaling is called ventilation. And inspiration is another word we use for in, inhaling. It's just like pulling out the plunger when we increase the space in our lungs as the diaphragm and the uh, these intercostal muscles, the thoracic muscles here increase this space. It's going to increase the volume and decrease the pressure and the air is going to rush in. So intraalveolar pressure decreases to 758 millimeters of mercury as the thoracic cavity enlarges. And so we were at 760, now we're decreased to 758, and atmospheric pressure forces the air into the passageway. So as this thoracic cavity enlarges, it's going to pull the air in. Okay, so atmospheric pressure is 760. So we said it moves from a higher pressure to a low, sort of like diffusion as we talked about before, a movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. But now we're talking about atmospheric pressure. So 760 millimeters per mercury of mercury. Uh, and then the intraalveolar pressure reduced to 758 by enlarging the thoracic cavities with the action of these muscles is going to pull that air into that passageway and into our lungs. Now while this is happening let me say something about the chemical we produce called surfactant. 
Now these alveolar, alveolus, alveoli have um, liquid on the surface of them and uh, most of our interstitial fluids is made up of water and let me talk just for a second about the uh, chemical makeup of water it is two hydrogens and one oxygen and hydrogens have these negative um, negative units that spin around on the outside of the atom this 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 hydrogen atom as it shares with the oxygen okay but it tends to give up the electrons which are negatively charged and oxygen tends to hang on to them okay so in an H2O molecule the hydrogens pretty much give up their negative charged electrons and the oxygens tend to hog them or or hold on to them so a water molecule on the hydrogen side is more positively charged because in the nucleus there is a positive proton and it's given up its negative electrons to the oxygen atoms so the oxygen atoms have more negative charges than they do positive charges within the nucleus well you uh, probably have heard about this before but these are called polar molecules it forms a covalent bond but it's not equal in its sharing covalent means that it shares electrons the, the oxygen holds on to the electrons so it tends to be a little more negative where the hydrogen side of that H2O is a little more positive so we call this molecule a polar molecule uh, you probably have heard of magnets have a polar end to them or poles a negative and a positive well these water molecules have a negative and a positive and because they have a negative and a positive area on them they're polar molecules they tend to stick to each other just like mag the ends of a magnet the negative and the positive attract each other well the same thing happens with these water molecules so they co they have cohesion they stick together we produce a chemical called a surfactant you know of a surfactant in your kitchen you have dishwasher det dishwashing detergent and you add it to your water and it keeps these water molecules from sticking together so that you can pull away the soiled um, food or whatever is found on your dishes and it can be broken apart in that water because of that surfactant if we didn't add the soap to the water it would not clean your dishes if we did not make surfactant then our alveoli would collapse on one another why because the stickiness of those polar water molecules so that is the very important job of surfactant with the breathing, mexi uh, breathing mechanism continue the maximum inspiration the thorax at the end of a normal uh, inspiration the, the thorax expands the external intercostal muscles pull the ribs up and out the diaphragm contracts and as the diaphragm contracts it pulls down and it enlarges the thoracic cavity where the sternocleidomastoid elevates the sternum opens it wide up the pectoralis minor elevates the ribs the diaphragm even contracts more and the thorax at the end of maximum inspiration is aided by the contraction of these muscles which expands that thoracic cavity start out a little smaller over here it really um, enlarges here and as this space enlarges the volume in that space increases and when volume increases pressure decreases 
and as pressure decreases the air is going to rush in inspiration expiration or exhaling is due to the elastic recoil of the lung tissues and abdominal organs so as everything is pushed back into place after you take that maximum inspiration those muscles are going to relax and the thoracic cavity is going to go back to its normal size those abdominal muscles will recoil and push the diaphragm upward the posterior internal intercostal muscles will pull the ribs down and inwards abdominal organs force the diaphragm even higher abdominal wall muscles contract and compress the abdominal organs holds them in their place and decreases the size or volume of this thoracic space as the volume decreases the atmospheric pressure increases and it will forcefully push that air out so really expiration happens due to the elastic recoil of the tissues the lung tissues and the abdominal organs so let's review just again, again real quickly just like pulling out the plunger it increases the volume or space the thoracic cavity enlarges in an inspiration air rushes in and it happens inspiration happens due to atmospheric pressure the changing of the atmospheric pressure within that thoracic cavity as it relates to the outside atmospheric pressure so that's how inspiration happens expiration happens due to the elastic recoil of the lung tissues and abdominal organs okay so know what the force is behind each one of these inspiration or inhaling and then expiration maximum expiration is the contraction of the abdominal wall muscles the contraction of the posterior inter, uh, internal intercostal muscles to make that thoracic cavity even smaller for that maximum expiration at the end of expiration air pressure and alveolar air pressure are equal therefore no movement of air into or out of the lungs takes place inspiration begins with contraction of inspiratory muscles to increase thoracic volume this results in expansion of the lungs and an increase in alveolar volume the increased alveolar volume causes a decrease in alveolar pressure below barometric air pressure and air flows into the lungs. At the end of inspiration, the thorax and alveoli stop expanding. Air flow into the lungs causes alveolar pressure to become equal to barometric air pressure. Because the pressures become equal, no more movement of air occurs. During expiration, the volume of the thorax decreases as the diaphragm relaxes and the thorax and lungs recoil. This results in a decrease in alveolar volume and an increase in alveolar pressure. Since the alveolar pressure is now greater than barometric air pressure, air flows out of the lungs. Air continues to flow out of the lungs until alveolar pressure becomes equal to barometric pressure. okay let's look at this chart this graph and go over the different parts let's first look at tidal volume this wave here is the measurement of tidal volume what is tidal volume now if you advance the slide one more time you would see these definitions but I'd like to go over these with this graph and then we'll go over the definitions again tidal volume is the volume move in and out during normal breath so as you're breathing as you're carrying on 
ventilation, your normal in and out, moving air in and out, and normal breathing is tidal volume. Here it is. Okay. Inspiratory reserve volume. Inspiratory reserve volume is from here to here. It is the volume that can be inhaled during forced breathing in addition to tidal volume. So tidal volume is your normal breathing. But take a deeper breath in this inspirational inspiratory reserve volume increases. Okay, so that's on top of tidal volume. So that with that deep breath. Expiratory reserve volume is the volume that can be exhaled during forced breathing in addition to tidal volume. So here is your tidal volume and then expi expiratory reserve volume. The volume that can be exhaled <sighs> during forced breathing in addition to the tidal volume. Okay, see that this arrow represents that expiratory reserve volume. Residual volume is a volume that remains in the lungs at all times. So you do not, even though you forcefully try to expire or expiration or expire all or exhale all the air out of your lungs there is still going to be a residual amount of air still left in your lungs and this is called the residual volume okay vital capacity is the tight here's the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. So there's the inspiratory and the expiratory and then the title. So the vital capacity would be adding up these numbers. Okay, from here to here. Add the tidal volume plus the inspiratory volume that extra deep breath and then exhale tidal volume and then plus force more out for that expiratory reserve volume add all that up and that would be vital capacity total lung capacity would be the vital capacity plus the residual volume. So that would be the total lung capacity. Okay? Total lung capacity. Let's go over those real quickly again and look at some numbers. Tidal volume, your normal inhaling and exhaling inspiration and expiration is about 500 milliliters in volume. Inspiratory reserve volume, what you can take that deeper breath and bring into your lungs, a volume that can be inhaled during forced breathing in addition to the tidal volume. So you can go from 500 milliliters to 3,000 milliliters of volume. Expiratory reserve volume, the volume that can be exhaled during forced breathing in addition to the tidal volume. So about 1,100 milliliters forced, forcefully exhaled. The residual volume is what stays in your lungs all the time. So as you're inhaling and exhaling during regular ventilation, you are going to be mixing new air with residual air. So you're going to have new air mixing with old. So the volume that remains in the lungs at all times is called the residual volume. Vital capacity is adding that tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. 
That's the maximal amount of air that can be exhaled after a maximum inspiration for the vital capacity. And total lung capacity is the vital capacity plus residual volume. So after you calculate this, you add to it what's left in the lungs no matter what you do. That old air. The vital capacity, the new inhaled and exhaled, plus the residual volume the total amount of air that your lungs can hold. Okay, now you need to be familiar with all those things in that graph and how you calculate the um, vital capacity and total lung capacity and you are going to look at that again in lab. Now how do we control? How is breathing controlled? There is nervous controlled so there's two separate mechanisms. The voluntary system, it originates in the cerebral cortex and controls breathing during speaking and eating. So this is voluntary speech, cerebral cortex, and breathing during your um, eating and speaking. Involuntary system, it's located in the medulla oblongata and a little control comes with the pons. It's called the respiratory center. It regulates respiration according to the metabolic needs of the body. Okay, so voluntary. We'll take a deep breath and hold it. That's voluntary, isn't it? But you can hold your breath only so long and then you pass out and then the involuntary system takes over. The medulla oblongata and the pons, that respiratory center, is going to have you breathing again. So that voluntary system only works to a certain degree. And here we have the pneumotaxic area. The depth of breathing is regulated here by the pons. And then you have the medulla oblongata the ventral respiratory group and the dorsal respiratory group and the rhythmicity area controlled by the medulla oblongata and the pneumotaxic and the pons. We know that the control of breathing in the respiratory center is found in the brain stem here but we don't know uh, everything there is to know about what controls and how it's controlled. We just have a good idea of it, the area of the pneumotaxic region and the uh, respiratory regions. The main player here is the medulla, medulla oblongata with some backup from the area of the pons. Now, we know that in metabolism there is a byproduct called carbon dioxide. It is a waste product. We cannot use carbon dioxide. We have to get rid of it. So there is some chemical control of breathing. Carbon dioxide mixes with water to form, high, uh, to form carbonic acid. And we have a way, we have enzymes that help to break down this carbonic acid. And these enzymes act as buffers also. And in buffering, because this is an, ad, an acid, we need to control what is um, in our bloodstream. So um, this carbonic acid will be broken down even further into these hydrogens and these bicarbonates. Most of the carbon dioxide that is carried within your bloodstream is carried as bicarbonate ions. So it reacts with water, the carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid that will undergo a reaction that releases the hydrogens and then uh, the carbon dioxide is carried by in the bloodstream as carbonic acid and when it gets to the lungs it's broken down again those hydrogens are released 
and then an oxygen. Ah, it forms the water. We started out with water. We end up with water, and that carbon dioxide is released. So that hydrogen binds over there in an oxygen, and that because of two hydrogens and an oxygen, water plus carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide is exchanged at the alveolar level. And here we go. So high blood PCO2, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and high cerebral spinal fluid of hydrogen concentration stimulate the chemoreceptors in the respiratory center. So as these are stimulated, the chemoreceptors in the respiratory center, then the alveolar ventilation increases. So what controls the uh, ventilation? would be the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. So here is a regulator of how much and how uh, it controls your breathing is the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. The alveolar ventilation increases as carbon dioxide. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases. So the carbon dioxide is as ventilation increases, carbon dioxide levels will decrease. That exchange will happen in the lungs. The hydrogen increases in the cerebral spinal fluid. The decrease in blood oxygen concentration stimulates peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic bodies. So within the aorta here, and the carotid arteries. You have these areas that have chemoreceptors. Remember that's part of the sensory receptors in the nervous system. Chemoreceptors send the information to the medulla oblongata, the sensory, by, by way of the sensory nerves. Okay, so the amount of oxygen when it decreases and the amount of carbon dioxide it's sensed in by these chemoreceptors in the aortic bodies and the carotid bodies and it stimulates the medulla oblongata the respiratory center for breathing so carbon dioxide serves as a um, stimulator for the respiratory center Okay, so this is the sensory, and then the from the brain you will have a motor response to the muscles of the thoracic cavity, including the diaphragm, to contract. So these are sensory, and then you have a motor response to those motor via the motor nerves to the muscles to cause them to contract to enlarge that thoracic cavity, increase the volume in the lungs, decrease the pressure, the air rushes in, you have the exchange, and so here's how the process works. Decreased blood oxygen concentration stimulates the peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid and the aortic bodies. Does not occur until oxygen concentration is low. Okay, so chemoreceptors respond. Let's go back to that slide for just a minute. So again, I'm just going to say this. Chemoreceptors are excitatory because the chemoreceptors are going to sense the amount of oxygen in the blood and the carbon dioxide. It's going to send a motor response to the abdominal, or not the abdominal, but the thoracic muscles and the diaphragm contract because a breath is needed, exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen needs to take place because oxygen concentration is low and carbon dioxide concentration is high. So those chemoreceptors are excitatory. They cause things to happen in response to the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood. Sending a motor response, remember this would be e uh, this would be afferent and then an efferent response to those muscles to cause them to contract. You take a deep breath 
so you can have exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen so it's excitatory. The heron Briar reflex, the expansion of the lungs, stimulates stretch receptors in the lungs. So you can only stretch these muscles so far. So these, these stretch receptors are needed. So these stretch receptors are stimulated when these muscles contract and enlarge this area. Okay? Inhibitory impulses from the receptors of the respiratory center prevent the overinflation of lungs. So the stretch receptors pick up that uh, these muscles have been contracted and so what happens is that you have an inhibitory response from the respiratory center. So with the stretch receptors it sends an impulse to the brain and this impulse says okay these muscles have expanded the thoracic cavity all it needs to expand we don't need any overinflation of the lungs so you've got to stop the uh, action of these muscles so there is an inhibitory response so you don't have an overinflation of these lungs. So let's review that. We had the chemoreceptors in the aortic and carotid bodies and these in this information, the chemoreceptor sent the information to the brain that says oxygen levels are low, carbon dioxide levels are high, so there's an excitatory response. And then uh, the motor reflex or the motor um, response to the muscles say contract, expand this thoracic cavity. The diaphragm comes uh, drops and the intercostal cartilage and muscles expand that thoracic cavity. Those stretch receptors pick up that action, that information, sends that information to the respiratory center and says, oh, these, this thoracic cavity has expanded enough. We don't need any more. We're at a stopping point here. So inhibitory impulses come from the respiratory center to prevent the any more expansion of those that thoracic cavities and those muscles begin to relax and you have the um, expiratory res uh, resulting factor. Okay, so what's in, in excitatory and what's inhibitory here? The excitatory, the chemoreceptors. Inhibitories would be the stretch receptors. They stop the action. Excitatory, the chemoreceptors receiving the information that oxygen is low and carbon dioxide is high, sends a response to the muscles, the motor response. A, uh, efferent to the muscles so they can contract, expand the thoracic cavity with the dropping of the diaphragm and expansion of the thoracic cavity, then those stretch receptors pick up that information, take it to the brain, and the response is inhibitory. Stop all that stretching. We need to relax now so that this person can exhale. So with stretch receptors, they're inhibitory. Okay, the alveolar gas exchange, the structure of, of the alveoli or alveolus. One is alveolus, alveoli is plural. It again is one layer in thickness. It is a simple squamous epithelial layer. Okay, and then there is a, a respiratory membrane, and that membrane is that one layer of the 
alveoli and then there is the capillary layer and that it is only one or a simple squamous epithelial layer also and then there's basement membrane in between those two so it's actually like four membranes it is a simple squamous epithelial um, cell layer in the capillary then basement membrane and then you have the simple squamous epithelium of the alveoli and this very thin layer is where the exchange of carbon dioxide from the blood it moves from an area of higher concentration in the blood or partial pressure concentration the PCO2 is higher in the blood so it moves into the alveoli the partial pressure of oxygen or the PO2 is higher in the alveolus than it is in the blood and so it'll move an area of higher from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration so CO2 PCO2 is in higher or um, is in higher concentration the capillary moves into the alveolus the PO2 the oxygen is in higher concentration in the alveolus and moves from the alveolus into the bloodstream and it consists of the walls of the alveolus and the capillary so here's the alveolus there's the respiratory membrane so you have this simple layer of squamous epithelium simple layer of squamous epithelium with this membrane in between this basement membrane in between so it's passing from one simple layer through the membrane through the other simple layer now here we have a surfactant secreting cell again there is surfactant here we produce surfactant to keep these alveoli the alveolus from collapsing on itself why because there's a lot of water here a lot of fluid and that water is sticky just like I said before it's polar and polar molecules track you ever attract each other you ever waxed your car and then you watch the water droplets on the surface of that wax car as they get close to each other they sort of attract each other and where two, you had two little drops of water come together for a bigger drop of water this is what would happen in our alveolus and each of those individual air sacs they would just collapse on each other if we didn't have surfactant that keeps that alveolus open okay and the squamous single simple squamous epithelium that cell of the alveolar wall okay macrophages now these are phagocytic these are white blood cells that are in the respiratory area in the alveolus that helps to fight off infection if something passes through that trachea down to the lungs and gets into the lungs then these macrophages can help to fight infection they help to break down debris into smaller more controllable parts and uh, kill microorganisms and so forth and so on so that's the job of the macrophage in that alveolus now the composition of air is about 21 percent the air that we breathe in our atmospheric air 21 percent oxygen 79 percent nitrogen and about uh, four one four one hundredths percent of carbon dioxide Dalton's law says in a mixture of gases each of these gases gases exert, exerts its own pressure in proportion to the whole mixture partial pressure is designated by the symbol P I've mentioned it a few minutes ago PO2 and PCO2 in front of the chemical symbol for the gas partial pressure is expressed in millimeters of mercury
So partial pressure of oxygen in the atmos atmosphere, 21% oxygen. So this 21%, if we wanted to do some math here, we could take the partial pres pressure. Okay, we know that the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters millimeters of mercury and then we could divide that by 21% or multiply it by 0.21 and get a partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere and so that would be the PC that would be the CO2 then you can get the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and that would be PCO2 it's all in the math. And there it is. For uh, partial pressure of oxygen, PCO2 in the atmosphere, 21, um, because that was 21%, that'd be 0 0.21 times 760 millimeters of mercury would equal about 160 millimeters of mercury. PCO2 was because that was was a percentage it would be 0 0.04 over 100 d divided by 100 times just move that decimal point that would be the easiest way times 760 millimeters of mercury equals 3.3 millimeters of mercury and that would be the partial pressure of carbon dioxide carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So that would be the PCO2. Now what's important about this? Well remember we said that molecules will move from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. Well this is also true when we're talking about partial pressure of gases. Alveolar gas exchange is diffusion through a respiratory membrane, so you have diffusion going on, and it's going to move according to the partial pressure from areas of high partial pressure to an area of lower partial pressure. So gases are exchanged between alveolar air and capillary blood because of the differences in the partial pressure. Gases diffuse from an area of high to low partial pressures regardless of what other gases are pres present. That's why we call it partial because there's going to be other gases pres present and we're only talking about that one particular gas among the others. Okay, So you're going to have some regular O um, diffusion, that physical process, movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, and you're also going to have the movement of these molecules according to their partial pressures. Okay, here's the alve alveolus. Alright, let's look at the partial pressure within that alveolus. Your PO2 has a partial pressure of 104 millimeters of mercury, that PC, PO2, PO2, that's partial pressure of oxygen. So PO2 is 104. Well, let's look in the bloodstream and see what the partial pressure of oxygen is. It's P, the PO2 is equal to 40 millimeters of mercury. So, okay, so which is higher, 104 or 40? So which way is the oxygen going to move? Because of the partial pressure, the oxygen, the uh, PO2 is going to move from the alveolus into the bloodstream, into the capillary, and as it moves here, then you're going to have a change in the partial pressure until they equalize and then you will not have movement of oxygen because of the differences in partial pressure. You have equalization here. Okay, let's look at the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So PCO2 in the bloodstream is going to be 45. The PCO2, you've just taken that deep breath of air and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 40 in that alveolus.
So which one's higher? Well, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is higher in the bloodstream because it's 45 compared to 40 in the alveolus. So which way is the carbon dioxide going to move? From an area of high pressure to an area of lower pressure. So it's going to move from the blood, the capillary, to the alveolus. Okay, so that's how we're exchanging these gases. Looking at the some diffusions going on, but movement of these molecules by their pressures. These gases, moving of these gases by their partial pressures. Okay, go back and review over that again. Respiration serves as a means for the body to exchange gases with the atmosphere via the blood. The partial pressure of oxygen, PO2, in the air in the alveolar spaces in the lungs is greater than the PO2 in the blood, so oxygen diffuses into red blood cells from air in the lungs. Also, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, PCO2, in the air in the lungs is less than the PCO2 in the blood. So carbon dioxide diffuses out from red blood cells and into the air in the lungs. Oxygen-rich blood is carried through pulmonary veins to the heart and then pumped through systemic arteries to the body. The PO2 in the blood is higher than the PO2 in the body tissues, so oxygen diffuses out from red blood cells at the body tissues. Also, the PCO2 in the blood is lower than the PCO2 in the body tissues, so carbon dioxide diffuses into red blood cells there. Oxygen-poor blood is carried through systemic veins back to the heart and is pumped through pulmonary arteries to the lungs, where gas exchange again replenishes the blood with oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. Okay, with this animation you saw that there's also an exchange of gases at the tissue level where you have a higher concentration of oxygen in the blood and a lower concentration of, of oxygen in the tissues or partial pressures. Higher concentration of par or partial pressure PO2 in the bloodstream than you have in the tissues. So the blood will give up the PO2 to the tissues and the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide is greater in the tissue than it is initially in the bloodstream. And so the carbon dioxide, the PCO2, will move from the tissue to the bloodstream be carried back to the heart, be carried to the lungs so it can be oxygenated and you have the exchange of those gases in the in pulmonary circulation in the lungs. Now another way that carbon dioxide is transported or um, uh, we'll talk about in just a minute but we have a protein on that red blood cell called hemoglobin and that hemoglobin it is mainly iron that's what the prefix heme means so this protein is with an iron with um, an iron molecule will combine with the oxygen and hold on to it and carry that oxygen on that red blood cell so the transport of oxygen is when it binds to hemoglobin on the red blood cell. It's carried by the red blood cell to where it's needed. Most oxygen binds to the hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin releases oxygen into the regions of the body cells. Okay, just diffusion and partial pressures will help to move that oxygen from the bloodstream to the um, from the alveolus to the bloodstream from the bloodstream to the tissues 
because of diffusion and then the movement due to partial pressures. Okay, here we have the partial pressure of oxygen in the bloodstream is 90 millimeters of mercury. And then in the tissues, it's only 40 millimeters of mercury. So again, the oxygen is going to move from a higher partial pressure area to a lower partial pressure, and that's from the bloodstream to the tissue. And then as we move along in the systemic circulation, the oxygen partial pressure will decrease. And um, as it decreases, it more or less equalizes. It's like diffusion. Once you have equal number of molecules on both sides, then you stop having the diffusion of that particular gas. The diff if the partial pressures become more equal, the, the exchange is going to slow down and even stop as the blood flows to the lungs. Okay, so in this area, the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 millimeters of mercury, therefore you're not going to have the exchange of that gas of oxygen happening between the tissues and the blood vessels. You have some carbon dioxide is dissolved in the plasma. Do you remember how I said most carbon dioxide is carried? There it is, bicarbonate ions as we've mentioned before. And some of the carbon dioxide is going to combine with a hemoglobin. It is a different part of the hemoglobin than um, what the oxygen binds with, so it doesn't compete with oxygen and binding, binding to this red blood cell. It's going to bind to a carba, carbamino hemoglobin, carbamino hemoglobin hemoglobin. That area of that red blood cell does not compete with the hemoglobin that binds with oxygen. So some carbon dioxide is carried by that, re that red blood cell when it binds with um, carbamino hemoglobin. Okay, and so some is carried in the plasma by PCO2. Some of the carbon dioxide is carried by the red blood cell with um, carbamino hemoglobin. But most of the carbon dioxide is carried in carbonic acid or carbonic ions from car carbonic acid to carbonic ions as it combines with the hydrogens that carbonic ion, or that carbonic acid becomes a bicarbonate ion. Bicarbonate ions diffuse out the erythrocytes, and as that it diffuses out, it there is a chloride shift. Chloride ions from the plasma diffuses into the erythrocytes, so the red blood cells, and so the electrical ba balance is maintained because these are negatively charged and these are negatively charged. If you're giving up these negatively charged uh, bicarbonate ions, then you need to replace that negative charge and that's what that chloride does. So we, That's sometimes referred to as the chloride shift. Now carbon dioxide in the lungs, remember it's carried in three ways. Carbon dioxide dissolved in plasma, so it moves from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration in the alveolus, out of the plasma to the alveolus. Okay, then you have the partial pressure of carbon dioxide moving. Here the partial pressure is PCO2 is 45 millimeters of mercury and here in the alveolus you have 40 millimeters of mercury so it's going to move out of the bloodstream into the alveolus from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure and then you have the release of hydrogen from the bicarbonates 
and when you that bicarbonate is released then that carbon dioxide is given up that hydrogen binds with the oxygen to form to form water and it gives up that carbon dioxide that diffuses out and to from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration in the alveolus okay so you have the release of the hydrogen from the hemoglobin here and here and then after those the carbon dioxide is released the here we have the PCO2 is 40 and then and at the end of this run you have equal partial pressures of carbon dioxide so you don't have any more exchange of that carbon dioxide between the alveolus and the blood so the blood flows to the pulmonary venue back to the heart and to systemic circulation you have the picking up of oxygen but you've given off the carbon dioxide here and that's the end of the respiratory system next we're going to be looking at the urinary system and that is chapter 17